In this third part, I will present the end results and will give the methods and the ideas of the proofs. So let me start with this useful lemma. Uh, the setting here is a compact metric space uh, with the metric T naught. And then we have uh, alpha uh, that is in the open interval zero one. And if we have a sequence of uh, distances on M, so there are functions defined on the product N times N, and we have that the sequence of distances so the C alpha norm of the sequence of distance is uniformly bounded by this constant C. Then we have that there exists a subsequence. Uh, and then there is a, a function, the infinity, such that the subsequence convergence to this limiting function uniformly on n times n. And it also converges in this, um, in a C alpha prime um, topology for alpha prime uh, between zero and alpha. So moreover, uh, there is a convergence uh, in the group of Hausdorff sense for these metric spaces uh, to a space, a metric space, but this metric space here is, um, is the quotient of uh, the initial metric space by an uh, equivalence relation where two, two points are related in fact only if this limiting function the infinity of x and y is here. So this is how we obtain uh, the convergence in the group of Hausdorff sense to this uh, limiting space. So about the proof of this uh, lemma, we just need to notice that uh, the uniform bound on the C alpha norms of the distances, so these uniform bound implies uh, this inequality. So this is, it follows a straightforward from the unbound for every x and y and x prime and y prime in M. Then by uh, the theorem of arcelas coli we can start a subsequence uh, that converges in the C0 uniform topology to this limiting distance, uh, not this limiting function that is not yet a distance, uh, but that satisfies the triangular inequality. So the infinity induces a distance on this cushion space, as I explained before, and uh, the C0 uniform converse implies the chrome of Hausdorff convergence. And the convergence in the space uh, C alpha, for alpha between zero and, uh, and since zero alpha prime for alpha prime between zero and alpha that should be smaller than one is elementary, follows just by elementary inequalities uh, using this, this relation here. So now our uh, theorem one is the same as uh, we presented it in the introduction. And so here uh, we have again the sequence of metrics, we have the uniform bound on the volume, and here we have um, the, uh, this estimate on L and our two norms of the positive power of the scalar curvatures. And as we saw in the examples, um, in the example by uh, uh, Chan, Wurski, and Wolf, uh, this uh, constancy uh, alpha of n is critical, so we have to go below this value. So, as I pointed out here, the curvature hypothesis rules out uh, the case of example one, so we don't have a bubble. So, with these conditions, we have the existence of the subsequence for which uh, the metric space is uh, the sequence of metric spaces convergence in the form of Hausdorff topology. Uh, well, here we have the same uh, remark as before. There is a convergence to a limiting function, but uh, to have a metric space here, we have to take um, the quotient of M by this equivalent relation. So the metric spaces will converge to this limiting space uh, where we have to clean this quotient. So there can be some collapsing of certain parts of the, of the manifold. So now let me tell you how is uh, the proof of this, uh, or the, the main ideas of the proof of this theorem. Um, so we, we consider again, uh, then both notations. So for a, conform, a metric conformal to G node, we have e to the power uh, to fk, 
and C naught, or we use also uk to the power 4 divided by n minus 2. So we fix here an uh, x in m and we define these functions uh, rho k of y that is just being by the distance in the the Riemannian distance for the metric to k between x and y. And uh, so we use this uh, well-known classical result that uh, the gk norm of the g grid gk gradient of the distance function is equals to one almost everywhere. So not in every point, but almost everywhere. And using the, the conformal transformation, so how the gradient transforms conformally and how the uh, metric transforms conformally, we can prove that um, the G0 norm of the uh, G naught gradient of rho sub k is e to the power of fk of y. So using that, um, we have that the integral over m of the g0 norm to the p of the gradient uh, in g0 of the, of the functions g uh, rho k integrated respect to the g0 volume is going to be equal to the integral over m of e to the p fk integrated uh, with respect to the g0 volume. So if p is equals to n, we will have just here the volume of, um, of the manifold m with the metric k. And this will be uniformly bounded. However, this part uh, is not going to be useful for our purposes because these ln bounds uh, on the gradient won't give us compactness. But uh, we will see what we will do with that. So here, the point is we need to have a uniform bound on some p uh, strictly bigger than n. So to obtain that, um, we use uh, this optimal solid inequality by Ebe and Bougon that, uh, that is written here. So this is um, a very nice optimal inequality. So here we have alpha n. So we have this uh, inequality says that there exists a constant b. So if we have any smooth function on the manifold, uh, this is the L 2n over n minus 2 norm of, of phi to the power 2. So this, uh, this is going to be a smaller or equal than this constant times, and this is going to be the, L, the square of the L2 norm of B phi plus, so this constant B, times the uh, square of the L2 norm of phi. So we apply this uh, inequality to the function uk that appears here in the conformal factor uh, to the power one plus epsilon. And uh, using that we can obtain a uniform estimate on this integral with p uh, strictly bigger than n. And there we can use uh, the compactness of the solar embedding uh, w1 p not into uh, c not of n. So that's how the proof of this theorem goes. So with that, uh, we can obtain the corollary that I mentioned at the introduction. And um, the proof is not trivial, so one has to still write your thing, but it follows from theorem one and other well-known results. Okay. So now I want to, to recall this um, relation with the analytical properties of the volume densities that I also mentioned in the introduction. So we want to pass from these critical estimates to have some strong infinity weight property on the, on the volume densities, and this will give us uh, the Gromov-Hauser recompactness. So I will start defining this infinity weight. So they are also called Mockenhoff weights, and um, they came in relation with harmonic analysis in RM. And here I wrote some of the names of people who have worked with these um, infinity weights and, and studied several of their properties. So they are Stein, David and Semes, Semes, and von Heinoken and Saxman. And the list is not restricted to this one. 
So, so here for for the notation, we will be using so the the closed human M nine four will be again M of dimension M, and we have the metric denote and the the Riemannian distance is denote. This is going to be the volume, uh, the Riemannian volume element, and this is going to be the measure. So this uh, B uh, is a geodesic ball with respect to metric uh, G naught. And for any subset of M, uh, this uh, integral uh, with the line is uh, just the average on the set of the function. So it's the integral of F on the set divided by the measure of the set. And here we come with the definition of B. So we first we see what is uh, to be an infinity weight and later we'll see what is to be an strong infinity weight. So if we start with a function that is uh, in L1 of M and is uh, non-negative, so this function is an infinity weight with respect to the to the remaining metric G0 if there exists a number Q is strictly bigger than one and if there exists a constant such that for all G0 geodesic balls, we have that this uh, reverse field inequality is satisfied. So um, this is uh, the this average of WQ um, over B to the power of one over Q is smaller or equal than C times the average of W um, with respect to the point. So the definition that I just gave of um, of uh, being an infinity weight is equivalent to having uh, this other relation. Uh, it looks uh, a bit different, but one can go from one to the other and relate the constants of one with the one of the other. So here we'll have the direct on P is uh, strictly bigger than one and a constant C, such that for all geodesic poles, uh, this average of the function omega over b times uh, the average of the function omega, but here to the power minus one uh, over p minus one, and this to the power of p minus one is strictly, um, is smaller or equal to c. So now let me uh, tell you some of the geometric properties of infinity weights. We have um, a metric conformal uh, to G naught, and we have the associated uh, Riemannian measure and the volume element E to the NF. So if we have that this um, volume element E to the power NF is uh, infinity weight with respect to the metric um, G naught, so this means that uh, these equations um, are satisfied. So here, uh, this is the, the function with respect to these geodesic poles. Then uh, we have that uh, the measure uh, mu uh, sub f is doubling with respect to G0 geodesic poles. So this is the doubling condition. So the measure of twice the ball is a smaller equal than uh, a constant theta times the measure of the ball for all balls. And um, another property is that uh, these properties hold for any radius. And uh, this is a very important property here is that if we have that these um, volume element is an infinity weight, then we have that there exists a constant that depends, and here is where it matters where, on what the constant depends. It depends on C, Q, this is the constant of the infinity weights, and the metric uh, G naught. Such that for all X and Y in M, we have that uh, the Riemannian distance uh, DF um, between X and Y to the power of N is smaller than the constant P. And here we have uh, the integral over the ball of center x and radius uh, the distance uh, d naught between x and y of the volume element with respect to the uh, 
and to the measure uh, mu naught. This is just, uh, the volume of this body. Now let me tell you about this proposition that tells us about the relation between being infinity weights and precompactness. Here we have uh, two constants C and B that have to be positive. We have an R naught that has to be positive, but uh, smaller than the diameter of M with respect to the metric T naught. And we have uh, another constant Q bigger than one. So we define uh, again a calligraphic M that is going to be a set that depends on B are not q and c so our function is in this set m if it satisfies that the the conformal metric defined by e to the 2 f g naught satisfied that this volume is bounded by uh, above by b and we have that um, omega equals to e to the n f is an a infinity weight with uniform constants R naught, Q, and C. So if we have this, uh, we have that the distances, uh, P sub F associated to F in the set M, calligraphic M, is pre compact in the Helder topology C alpha for alpha between 0 and 1 minus 1 over Q. And uh, also, we also have that the associated metric spaces M with the, with the distances uh, D sub F with F in M is pre compact in the group of house of topology. So we also have uh, this theorem that relates uh, this uh, critical property estimates to infinity weights. So here we have the same setting and we have a uh, constant lambda, delta and are not bigger than zero. So if we have a smooth function and the associated um, conformal metric, and if we have that the L and over two norm of this um, of the scalar curvature of this metric is bounded by above by lambda, and if we have that the L and over two norm of the positive part of the scalar curvature, uh, but localized to G zero geodesic balls of radius R naught, if this uh, quantity is smaller than um, alpha n minus delta, yeah, delta has to be positive, for all ball uh, of this type, uh, then we have that uh, E to the power n f is a uh, infinity weight with constants depending only on n, on G naught, on R naught, on delta, and on lambda. So the proof of this theorem was uh, inspired by the uh, Hartnack's inequalities proof for positive solutions of second order differential equations. And for those of you who don't remember uh, the equation I'm mentioning, um, I, I tell you, is uh, that says that there exists a constant uh, triple bigger than one, such that if a function b is an eigenfunction of um, the Laplace operator for the zero eigenvalue, and is non-negative, then the supreme of P on its domain is smaller or equal than this constant C times the infimum of V on DC. Now I will define a strong infinity weight. So the setting is the same as before. We have the metric T naught, GF, a conformal transformation of T naught, and the volume density of GF is E to the NF. So we say that uh, this volume density is a strong infinity weight with respect to the metric G naught if these two conditions are satisfied. So uh, these uh, constants appearing here, so uh, eta and theta, are part of the definition and it's important for us later on to know what they will depend on. So, but for, for now we just give the definition that this is with constants uh, theta and eta. And um, so the first, the first condition here is just a doubling property for the mu f volume of the G naught geodesic balls. So we have this here. This will be valid for radius smaller than uh, eta, and the constant is uh, theta. 
notice that uh, this is the same as it happens with Euclidean metric. And for the second condition, we also have we have something uh, very similar to what happens with the with the Euclidean uh, metric in Rn. That is that uh, the end power of the radius is comparable to the end volume of balls. But here is of course adapted to uh, the the volumes um, mu f, and it has to be for g not geodesic balls. So here it appears these these conditions. So notice here the constant uh, theta appear again for the um, here the left of the inequality here on the right of the inequality. Uh, here we have the end powers of the distance df, and here we have the mu f volume of these g naught distances. But here, for these balls, we have the the g naught distance of x and y. So these strong infinity weights were introduced by David and Simmons, and of course, as we can see here, they are related to the relation distance volume. Uh, another remark is that a strong infinity weight implies uh, infinity weights. And for example, if you recall this uh, inequality we had already for infinity weight, so the, the new inequality will be coming here. And, uh, and as an example, uh, if we have our n with the Euclidean metric, we have that um, this density x to the power, uh, the norm of x to the power of beta is a strong infinity weight even uh, if beta could be negative, so beta has to be strictly bigger than minus n. So we can have these uh, singularities for for an infinity weight, a strong infinity weight. Now here let me mention some other properties. So we, we have that uh, a strong infinity weight can vanish on large sets to large order. And, um, and these, these sets could be made bigger if we choose them uh, adequately. Um, however, uh, it was proved uh, by Davis and Simon that it cannot vanish on a rectifiable curve. So, and so it, it can become singular, but not too too much in like in a good set. And on the other hand, um, we have these these other properties. If a density is a strong infinity weight, then we have that uh, the geodesic poles of the matrix GF and G naught are comparable. And this uh, will immediately imply that the uh, that the metric GF has the volume doubling property with respect to its own balls, no, only with respect to the G naught Jurassic balls. And uh, so the, the very important result is this one that was proved by David and Simons is that uh, for a strong infinity weights for um, metrics that satisfy uh, this property, we have that there is a solid inequality of Poincare inequality and an isoperimetric inequality. So now let me let me uh, recall the results I mentioned in the introduction, but now in terms of uh, the volume densities being a strong infinity weights. So this is the, the theorem three. So we have um, a closed manifold and uh, the Riemannian metric G naught. And what we prove is, is that there exists a constant lambda node that depends only on G naught, and such that if we have that there exists a, a radius, R node that uh, has to be uh, smaller than the diameter of M with respect to metric G naught, then uh, if we have a conformal transformation of this uh, G naught metric um, with this conformal factor, so this GF, and uh, so if we have that this GF satisfies this uh, inequality, so that the ln over two norm of the scalar curvature, but on balls of uh, radius r, any ball of radius r in n, if this quantity is bounded by this lambda node, then we have that uh, the volume density e to the nf is a strong infinity weight with constants 
depending only on G naught, R naught, and lambda naught. So uh, this is uh, the, uh, the, the so the, the first of this uh, main uh, theory. And uh, I will tell you now a little bit about this proof. So this proof is um, very long and has some parts that are a bit complicated. So I will just explain like uh, the main steps of how it goes. Um, okay, so what we have is that uh, we start with a Yamami's equation for u, where u is um, where the conformal factor of the GF metric can be written as u to the power of 4 over n minus 2. So this u satisfies a Schrodinger type equation. So here we have the Laplacian of G naught, and here we have a potential, but the potential so depends on f and of course uh, of u. So this is the, the formula for the potential here. And so if, if we choose this lambda node and R node small enough such that the, the norm of this potential in ln over two of localized to, to this genotheodic pulse of values R node, if this is smaller than this constant here, depending only on G node, R node, and lambda node. And if all of this is smaller than epsilon, then we can prove that there are these two functions, a function h that is in W2 n over 2, and a function omega that is in the Hilbert space uh, C alpha, such that f is going to be equal to this h plus omega, so with h here and omega here. And in addition, there is this very nice uh, inequality that is the one that will allow us to obtain the results. So this inequality says that uh, the L norm of pH uh, plus uh, the ln over 2 norm of the Laplacian of H is uh, bounded by this constant, but by a constant that depends only on G naught, R naught, and lambda naught. So, so this is the uh, um, main idea in the proof. And then uh, later, so in the, in the second part of the proof, uh, we adapted a result of von Heinoken and Saxman to show that uh, if uh, d for, for a function phi, if the d of phi is in ln, then we have that a to the power n phi is a strong infinity weight. So putting uh, these things together, we would obtain that e to the n f is a strong infinity weight, and that the constants that I mentioned before depend only on uh, g naught, lambda naught, r naught. So this is uh, like uh, the main ideas behind the proof of this uh, theorem three. So now we obtained as a corollary of this theorem and uh, of um, of previous corollary, <laughs> we obtain uh, this uh, corollary two, that is now uh, the geometric uh, part. So using the, the, the convergence, I mean the convergence. So we have a sequence of conformal metrics to G naught. And what we assume now is that the, the volume densities are a strong infinity weight with uniform constants, uh, eta and theta. And in addition, um, if we have uh, two constants V and capital V, such that uh, the volumes of the, of the matrix stay bounded between V and, uh, so below, by below by V and by above by capital V, then we have that there exists a subsequence uh, such that the associated metric spaces converge in C alpha in the Hilbert space and in the gram of Hausdorff uh, sense. And in addition, so this is really convergence of metric spaces, and we have that the limiting distance here is by Hilbert to the uh, initial uh, D naught distance. So we have that background distance. So we have that um, by Hilbert. We have this constant lambda and alpha. So here we have the usual constants of distances being equivalent. And here we have a power of one over alpha, and here we have a power of alpha. Mm. 
So let me mention here that in some recent work, Tong, Lee, and Chu uh, have shown that uh, for a sequence satisfying uh, the hypothesis of theorem three, then yeah, so if we have that the volume densities converge weakly to the limit uh, e to n f, in, f infinity, then the, the sequence of distances converges uniformly to um, the distance associated to a limiting uh, function f, f infinity. So, okay. So they, they actually answer a, a question that remained open in our paper. Let me tell you about the proof of corollary two. So um, here we have that uh, the density E to the NF is a strong infinity weight with constants eta and theta. And uh, here we will denote um, the denote distance between X and Y by R sub X, Y. And this is going to be smaller than eta. And we can rewrite the condition of um, being a strong infinity weight, the second condition, by reversing the roles of the mu measure of balls and the df distance. So we obtain a uh, disequality here. Here we have the mu f uh, volume to the power one over n, here two, here we have this constant, this constant, and here we have the df distance between x and y in the middle. So now um, we use this uh, other inequality here below that uh, is, um, it was proved by Glicorian and uh, saddle of cost. So in here we have the mu f volumes of these poles of radius theta on the left and on the right, to the power of one over n. Here we have the mu f volume uh, of this ball of radius r uh, sub x y to the power of one over n. And here we have uh, these radiuses of this ball and uh, these powers. And well, so using these uh, inequalities and inequalities, and also using that um, the volume of uh, the volume mu f of m is bounded by below uh, by d and by above by a capital B. So we can find some constant lambda depending on all these constants by um, B, capital B, omega, alpha, uh, theta, and eta, uh, such that uh, these uh, distances, so the distance d naught and d f are um, by Halder. So we have this and nice inequality here. And this immediately implies that the identity map is uh, uniformly by Halder continuous. And therefore we can extract the, the subsequence that converges in the Halder topology and the limit uh, function is meant to be a distance because it's by Halder to the to the denote distance because all the elements in the in the sequence are um, by holder to the denotes. So. Okay. And now to finish, uh, let me uh, rewrite theorem four from the introduction, but now taking into account the property of being a strong infinity weight. So here uh, we have Rn with the Euclidean background metric, and then we have the metric conformal to Euclidean metric. And the volume of our n with this metric is uh, infinity, and the ln over two norm, the total ln over two norm of the scalar curvature is finite. So, with these two conditions, we can prove that uh, the density e to the nf is a strong infinity weight with respect to the Euclidean metric uh, in Rn. And so, as a consequence, we have this relation between the radius of balls and the volumes of the balls. And uh, here we have the isoperimetric inequality that follows from the results of David and Sense. And with this, I finish my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. And I will show you some, some of the references that we use in our paper that are here. This is the first page. This is the second page. Again, thank you for your attention. All comments are welcomed and I look forward to talk to you if you have some of them.